Hey guys, how's everyone's day? All right, I'm Jake. Um, I'm a venture capitalist with Correlation Ventures. We are a $350 million uh, assets under management firm based on the West Coast. I run our New York City operations. Um, our kind of differentiator, if you will, is we leverage big data and predictive analytics to make all of our investment decisions. Uh, Patrick here is an unbelievable entrepreneur and founder who we've invested in. So uh, super happy to be here with you guys. Well, thank you. Patrick, g g g give a little bit of your background because you're, you're a legend. Well, well I'm, I'm glad to be here on a Saturday and uh, it's a beautiful day. Um, I've been involved with uh, building companies that have done billions of dollars in transactions um, from inception on a paper napkin to building it and selling to Google, empowering YouTube's uh, content licensing uh, systems globally. Um, personally, I've done on a private side and personal side, I've done hundreds of million dollars of transactions myself. So fundraising and making transactions happen is part of my daily life. Um, I'm now a founder and CEO of a company called Source3, which is trying to build a digital manufacturing platform similar to what YouTube did for video creators, but for all things manufacturing. Uh, big idea, hard problem to solve, but uh, I think we can do it. Uh, and I'm just here, I'm happy to share any knowledge. I've done every type of financing from using my 401k, my credit cards, my personal finances. I'm, a, I'm an all-in type of person, entrepreneur, and I like to win and try to win big and, and surround myself with as smart, many smart people as possible, like people like Jake. So pretty much how I want this talk to go is to extract as much knowledge from Patrick as possible. So I'll be asking him questions, um, and you guys feel free to ask as well, uh, myself and Patrick. Um, pretty much the fundamental reason Patrick's so awesome is because he's a repeat founder. He's a repeat entrepreneur. He has a ton of experience in different verticals. Um, and more applicable to this talk itself, he has a number of experiences with fundraising, um, both kind of in the classic sense of venture capital, from high net worth individuals, from firms, VC firms themselves. Um, but he also has a number of ways he views fundraising that's a little bit different than most, you know, classic entrepreneurs in today's tech ecosystem. So Patrick, could you talk about kind of how you went through, I guess, fundraising early on in your first company, which by the way, it was later acquired by Google. Um, and then kind of as you ramped up your second company, by the way, Correlation is an investor in a second company, uh, so he's a rock star. And uh, yeah, just kind of shed some light on that. I should have brought my wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, the, mo the most important thing that I learned, and I'll talk about what I learned, the hard lessons in the financial crisis, living through fundraising and, and uh, raising institutional capital is, you know, always be thinking about having capital available. And, and, and one thing, as you'll learn, is ca cash is king, whether it's your personal finances, it's the revenues you generate from your business, but always be positioned to how you get access to capital. I like to put my own money in, so when I started my first company, RightsFlow, I walked into this other company I worked with, gave them a big FU, walked out and started my company. I made money that first week, so I knew I could bet on myself. Got sued, but we settled. They became a big client later. But the lesson being learned is I had the resources of myself and my investment in my, who I am and what I was capable of doing first. And I think that as an entrepreneur, you should be thinking about that. I know I do investments, so similar to what we do this on institutional, I do it on angel, and I'm always sitting across the table from the people and saying, are they investing in themselves first? And we did that very successfully at RightsFlow because we were able to put our own money in. I put about 175000 in my own money, about 125000 in credit card debt. One thing I did very successfully, which I do now, is I lived debt-free, so I didn't have any debt. And what the great thing about the world we live in is America loves credit cards, and they love to give you credit cards when you have no debt. And so I took all that debt, I accumulated a cash pile, uh, cash pile with my money and it would help me position my company to start building the product and then start making money around it. And we were the, we were a bootstrapping scrappy company. We actually started making money the first week we launched the company, which is something sometimes very hard to do. But we were very cash conscious and we were, had the disciplines around how we managed the cash flow, whether it was for future needs or today's needs. And it's things that you need to learn. So if you say you're going to be an entrepreneur or you're going to start a company, learn how to become a finance whiz. Don't say, I don't understand how to put a financial model to get to learn, become the, one of the best at it because cash is king and things that you need to do. Eventually, we had generated enough cash where institutional money came in in 2009 
in the financial crisis, we couldn't get money from anyone except the credit card companies, actually, but then they stopped. And we were uh, fortunate to raise at the time, which was called a Series A round, a million and a half dollars, but we had revenue, and it was very hard to get that money, but um, it helped give us the, 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 the cap capital to help grow the business. So specifically, let's talk about entrepreneurs who are starting something, they have no kind of idea where they're going to be generating cash from. Well, what's your advice on that front? First, you know... And we're not talking about the Zuckerbergs of the yeah, world yeah, yeah. who are just, you know, they're <laughs> not even humans. Let's, let's, talk about, let's talk about real entrepreneurs who, who, who we know. You know, I'll talk about it from a business and then how you get the cash. But, you know, one of the things I like to do with idea generation, uh, generating, is I talk to everybody. I'll, I'll go to a coffee shop. I'm like, I, I was in, interested in 3D printing. What do you think of 3D printing? Like, I don't understand. Well, let me explain. Oh, that's interesting. So talk your ideas. Don't be afraid to share. And if someone starts doing what you're doing, you're doing something right. And, you know, so I, I share my information. I try to model out, you know, four things within, you know, the business which leads to cash. You know, you're identifying a problem, and it's got to be a good one. It can't be like, you know, problem with your wife, but a problem. You got to ha actually have some solution or technology that solves the problem. You got to figure out how do I make money? Is this a transactional based business? Do I make subscription based? Is it a SaaS model? You know, how do I make money? That's very important. And the fourth thing is what's my addressable market? If it's your wife and you, that's not a good business, but maybe it's 10 million people. And then the key to getting cash from the traditional side of the venture guys sitting across from people like Jake, they, they don't even want to know you have the right answer. Jake wants to know, and venture people want to know, you actually have thought about getting to the right answer, because nobody knows. You know, when we were raising capital after we sold at Google, it was different. It was actually quite comical, because we just yeah, put, a, I, we I put our faces and Google on it, and we were like, ah, we don't know, give us money. And people were like, fuck you, we're like, fuck you. And basically people gave us money with the premise that these guys will figure it out, because they are intelligent, identify a problem, which we had no idea create a technology, which we now have. We are now making money, and we have an address so market is celebrated. It's very important you learn those four key things to getting money from tr traditional, as well as testing the business idea for yourself on how you actually make money from your business. So your experience with your second company as opposed to your first company. Like, as you just said, you went into these offices second time around after you had sold your first business to Google, and you said, look at me. Look what I've done already. You're pretty much investing. They invested. In, we invested in you as a person. At the end of the day, that's that's really kind of the nature of it. Um, so talk talk a little bit about you know what what role track record plays in raising money, uh, executing on a business, but also you know kind of advice maybe for somebody who doesn't have you know a successful track record thus far you know someone who's fresh out of college but is 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 a whiz kid so so it's, it's very so we had a track record and and one of the things when we started our new company i i put in and deployed 708,000 of my own money so that was very important to investors again back to you investing in your company your idea you know even even need uh you have a product idea try to get something a minimal viable product use some engineering friends in college try to get something because people want to know you're, you're you're putting some you know time and money into it um all right, I was late, late night last night. What was the, what was the other part of the question? It, it really, it, how does it compare, I guess, raising money your second time around? Oh, so second time. And yeah. advice to yeah. kind of those so early entrepreneurs. Time, so so you're, yourself, so rewind so back to your first company, yeah. what, what advice do yeah, you so have the, now? So the second time around, um, when we sold to Google, my partner, who I am now working 12 years, we own a few companies together today, uh, looked at me and he said, Patrick, just for the record, I'll never fucking work with you again. <laughs> it, was that, it was that hard to get through the acquisition, the diligence. In any event, I spent the next few years at Google, I was like, I gotta get the team back. So the key thing is I got these key Google executives to quit these big seven-figure paying jobs to come work with me. So that was a key factor. So now I had this little team back together that we had proven that we could build a billion dollar business. And so that was key. And so it would help us tell a story that when we walked into venture capitals, and now the difference from 2009 and today, people were calling me, where, where in 2009, I couldn't return, get a return phone call, nor did I know how to get engaged with that community. So the doors open. I, I knew my value as, a, as an entrepreneur. I knew that I had the capabilities as an entrepreneur, and so I could sell that as a story. And so when I went into the venture world again, it went in, I went in with some first-class uh, conversations, which was great. Got a lot of no's 
Get to know quickly. Just remember that. Get, get people to say no very quickly in everything. You know, whether it's dating or not, just get to know. But you never know. So we got a lot of no's. And then finally, we're like, let's just change a word. So thinking about strategically how you position to your audience. And we knew the venture world now pretty well, where we knew who we wanted to talk to. We just changed a word on the dock. And all of a sudden, the money came in. We tried to raise two. We raised four. We're like, wow, this was, this was easy but hard. It's still hard because we had the plan. And we were very keen and smart about how we approached it. And we put a lot of homework into how we approach raising capital. And the people that I surround myself with, which are way smarter than me, can help me position how we want to get and raise capital. In 2009, we had great revenue. We were trying to raise money. It just was such a fragmented market. The, the world was upside down. And don't think it couldn't happen again. As you know, it can happen again. So think about how you position yourself for that future um, and how you, you think about fund, fundraising, even crowdsourcing from your friends, using platforms to get access to capital. You know, just figure out what's the best way to have capital. Capital and cash is king. Even today with my company, we think about cash all the time. Yeah, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. So Patrick here, he's pretty much done a lot of creative things in terms of fundraising. So people think of like uh, venture capital and, and raising money as an early entrepreneur. In the traditional sense, you go around and you pitch a bunch of high net worth individuals, a bunch of venture capitalists, firms. Um, Patrick has a, a number of different ways he thinks about it, including debt. And I uh, want to definitely discuss debt because it should not be overlooked. It's an incredibly important thing, especially when you're building a business, especially for, for the first time while you're young. Um, and then I also want to get into equity crowdfunding because that could be something that's definitely a part of the, the future of the DNA um, of venture capital and, and really of entrepreneurship in general. Uh, and then definitely want to want to get some some questions from the audience. So yeah, talk about talk about debt, man. Yeah, so I, I I've 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 gone from credit card debt um, to traditional institutional debt um, debt financing, um, you know, to using platforms like Prosper. I, I I like moving money. I'm I like making money. So I, I enjoy it still to this day. So I leverage every point of access I can to capital. You know, whether it's my other companies, my companies today, and I think that you know. If you're looking at debt, you know, you could obviously look at the credit cards. And I, I will tell you the story. I, I went to, when I quit my day job, uh, I, I, call, I canceled every credit card. People were on the phone saying, don't do it. And I'm like, listen, lady, I know you're in Idaho, wherever you are, Idaho. You, wouldn't, you be, wouldn't you love to be debt free? And I'd be like, yeah, you're right. So she stopped selling and they stopped selling. But the idea was I got access and leveraged debt to my advantage to turn return for me in the futures. Um, there's, there's Western technology investments out there. There's companies like Silicon Valley Bank, more, more geared towards the entrepreneur. You should look up these companies. Uh, a lot of the traditional institutional investors are like, debt is bad, it's evil, because if not used properly, it's real debt. It has to be paid back. It's first money out. I mean, you have to take it off the top. You know, uh, my, one of my friends who runs with the largest debt company, one of the largest debt companies in the world, I'm like, yeah, that was a bad deal. He goes, not for us. We got first money out. <laughs> and so it's a lot of fear in that. But I think you should learn the art of financing, whether it's traditional equity, giving away a portion of your company or using debt. We uh, used debt for the last mile of our exit to Google. We borrowed a million dollars in debt. We predicted within nine months we'd be in an exit situation. And we sold within six months, paid back the debt. The equity was preserved. And it was like, you guys were geniuses. And we were just like, yeah, we got lucky, but we were smart and logical about it. But you know, speaking to the crowdfunding, it's a $35 billion industry today, and there's accessible, there's access to capital, there's platforms, I think it's like 430 plus platforms around the world. Even peer lending with your friends and family, if there's a, there's a platform that you need to leverage access to capital, maybe you use that and then say you pay them 4% interest, 5%, whatever, better than money at the bank, and leverage every opportunity to get access to capital. And, and within friend peer-to-peer -peer lending, people are more likely to lend to their friends and families with it, they're knowing they're getting payment back with some sort of upside on Totally. I mean, the paradigm really has shifted in terms of equity crowdfunding. Um, it is an incredibly useful tool. I was with an entrepreneur just two days ago, and uh, he launched a campaign on a crowdfunding site called WeFunder, uh, a Y Combinator company for, for those you know, early entrepreneurs who want to check it out. Um, and in three days, he had raised $50,000. And this is not just from friends and family. They're from people who, uh, you know, the average Joe who's like, this is a great business. They're investing in a convertible note at a $20 million cap. And they can invest as little as 100 bucks. Now, and, you know, I'd, I'd assume that most of the investors that are putting in 100, 150 bucks probably don't realize what a $20 million cap is. Um, but they're excited about, you know, 
kind of being in the seat of an investor. They're sizing up a business plan. They're looking at a deck. Um, they're excited about it. The entrepreneur just raised $50,000 without having to go on one, one single meeting. Um, and, and the platform itself, the crowdfunding platform, was able to advertise for them, was able to, was able to generate social media marketing, was able to draw um, you know, eyes, really, to their, to their deck and get them, get them capital. So that is definitely something to, to, to think about moving forward. You know, and, and I think I didn't answer the earlier question, but I'll tie it to this. You know, if you go to those platforms, they're going to use and leverage that. You, you have to optimize who you are, what you do, why, and how. And you need to translate that. And, you know, things that you need to be doing is simplifying, A, the space you're in. People want to know you're in e-commerce, fintech. Make sure if you're looking for investors, look, they, they're interested in that space. You know, I wouldn't say I'd be in biomedical. I didn't know nothing about biomedical. So try to target that. But your messaging is key, your brand um, and how you position yourself, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in marketing, A, yourself first, but the benefit of your company and PR and having that. And, and so if it's an online platform, you're, you're in a crowd of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of other people and prospects. So that's just, that's just a connection for a transaction. But the reality is you have to invest in positioning yourself, you know, and telling that story. And the disadvantages today where you're a kid out of college, the key, what you'll have with, I think I was the question earlier, on how you get that investor is surrounding yourself. So if you're a person who just graduated business school, but you have no connections in the entrepreneur or venture community, get people to do, get mentors, advisors, give away a piece of your equity to get that in talent and surround yourself with as many smart people. I have mentors all over the, you know, the country that help me with certain disciplines that I call them up, whether it's industrial, design, 3D. And so do that. So the young entrepreneur come out, you know, and I always like to think of starting a company, you know, whether you have a technical founder or not. I'm a product and, and, and BD person, so we always find the problem, then build the product after. So we're not really concerned on technical solutions until later. But do you, do you think that's hindered you in terms of raising a, well, money in the past? Not, not a, people. They always ask us, and I say, in this one, it was interesting. We like, if you can tell us the problem, we'll build it. But there's no reason to build it. Thank God we didn't build any hardcore technology. We built it a year later until we understood the addressable market size opportunity. But it didn't hinder us. It may hinder some people. But with technology today, it, it's it's accessible. You can create you know products where in '09, I mean, you, I mean, I was paying like twenty something thousand dollars a month for cloud servers. Now it's I have three hundred fifty thousand credit from Amazon, uh, from Google, cloud from what's uh, IBM and cloud from from Google, AWS. No, they don't give that much. But there's so much. It's not even a cost anymore. Cloud, but technology is cheap today. It's just how you execute. But make sure you have smart people. I've been fortunate. My partner is an inside guy. He doesn't like doing this. I'm the outside guy. I love doing this. <laughs> so we work very well. It's, good. it's a good balance, usually. Um, do you want, you want to take some? Yeah, sure. any, anyone have any questions? Uh, feel free to shoot. Don't be shy. Yep. Yeah, sure. Selling the company? How did we approach it? Oh, selling your product. You know, the, 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 just you know, cust customer. Just talking to customers. You know, we we went in with an idea of building up. A, a, we 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 actually quit Google with like the attitude we'll figure something out, and that's what we did. But typically, what you need to do is once you've done. I, I feel you could. Use any words, but I, once you've identified a problem, technology, you have economics, and then you have an addressable market. You need to talk to customers. You need to engage them. Figure out will this solve a pain? Would they pay for it? Would your technology integrate with theirs? Depending if you're an enterprise business or a customer, consumer facing. Um, but it's really getting out and talking to customers and understanding will this you know, solve a pain? Where the advantage comes in if you if you're experienced person in a certain industry, it's easier because you talk, you can talk to your friends, you can talk to your, your previous peers, you know, I can get into Google, I can get into Intel, I can get into, so my, my, my problems of talking to customers are not challenging, it's just figuring out where it is to fit within the company and the organization, but it's really getting out there and talk, and yet, don't, don't make the mistake of just, oh, so everyone will use this, you know, I've, 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 you can't, I've, can't drink the Kool-Aid. Yeah, it, and I, I was asked, you know, I, I was asked, I get asked, from people, hey, you want to be a CEO of this company, and they raise twenty million, and you sit down and you like when you do the assumptions. Mean I run my own financial. I'm like, there's not a big market. I'm like, how did they raise it? But they raise it on their background. But do the math, and you know the big key is running an assumptions model. What's the predictability probability of converting that into money based on an addressable market of customers? Sorry, I speak fast. <laughs> So 
So a surplus in a startup, <laughs> you, you, you don't know. <laughs> you, you, yeah, you, you, you just want to, you want to, the key is to, you know, systematize and automate the customers and, and then create a repeat bit type business model that can scale. But in the early stages, you know, I, I advise talk to everybody, do small deals for, you know, just get the money in or just get the information in, do pilots. So and I, learn. I mean, and le learn. learning is, is key to everything, right? So like if you're not learning early on, you know, some people essentially view their first venture round as the runway you have to figure out product market fit, right? And to, and, and to learn that entire time, right? So some, so it depends really on your business model, but some entrepreneurs early on will view it as, hey, if I'm not learning, then this sale literally doesn't matter because I'm not building a sustainable business. And, and, and make a lot of mistakes, but you know, the key is innovate fast, fail faster. You know, don't keep repeating it, but, you know, learn from it and create, you know, figure out, but you have to, you know, sometimes you have to crack, uh, hit a wide net. You know, you might talk, you know, different industries and thinking out, should I be in this focus? You know, the key is to do one thing great. Just remember that. And then you excel at that and scale it. But, you know, you just don't want, you know, the challenges that don't, you can be is, are, am I in a, a consulting based business or a technology based business? I like to be in technology because I like to sell pencils because it just keep, Printing those suckers over and over. Consulting is cheap, and I don't like consulting. Anyone else? Take mic. All right. Um, yeah. So my question was essentially: you have a number of ridiculous valuations floating around right now, where you have companies which are cash flow negative, selling, uh, being valued for billions of dollars. And then you also have all these new technologies that people don't fully understand yet and we fully haven't scoped out. So how do you go about valuing technologies that aren't fully developed yet? Yeah, it's, it's really tough. I think, unfortunately, it's still incredibly subjective. <laughs> I mean, it really, it really depends on who the founding team is. It really depends on, obviously, the addressable market's incredibly important, but early on, if you're not making money and if you haven't really shown product market fit, where, whereby which you're addressing that, that addressable market, I, I, I don't know how you could truly quantify it. Um, now, what we're able to do at Correlation with data is really understand historically within the venture ecosystem. So essentially, private companies that have raised money in the past 40 to 50 years, we have data points on them. And it's not necessarily about um, really the advancements in technology that they're doing, and it's not necessarily even about the, the individual metrics by which they're earning revenue, um, they're making profits, so on and so forth. It's really about, we're, we're understanding and quantifying via big data what factors have correlated with success in venture before. So we're looking at it holistically and, and pretty much historically and uh, predicting for the future. And we're leveraging predictive analytics to do so. So there are a ton of things that can go into that. That's past founder history. Um, it could be the makeup of the board. It could be how good the investor is in investing in that particular sector. Um, it could be, you know, an, an entrepreneur could have a home run past experience within e-commerce, but if this is his first SaaS business, that might not, that might not, we, we, we might not, you know, warrant a value, it might not warrant a valuation as high as the founder might, li might, might like. Um, so I think it truly is subjective. It depends who you're, you're talking with. Uh, I think at the end of the day, you know, Patrick's a repeat entrepreneur. So at the, his second time around, he probably could have generated a higher valuation than if he walked into uh, those meetings as a, as a young founder and said, hey, look, look, look at me, like I'm here to raise money. Um, five minutes. Cool. Uh, what, what do you think? Yeah, just you know, try. It's a tough one, and I think you know, there's valuations, equity planning, distribute. I like to believe in giving it all away with some little piece for me that generates a huge return. <laughs> so that's how I am. And you have to think about investors. But there's you know, there's general research out there that you can actually understand the categories of valuations that they they invest in. You know, pe people invest in the idea that you can execute the business idea, and typically it's done with people. So they want to know there's a value to that team. That becomes the highest valuation when you're investing in a company. It's the team. The second is like, what's your process around the market opportunity and how you're going to address it? And then a technology, hopefully, that can enable the process and the people to succeed. Each one of those are usually weighted people high, process medium, because medium process can be band-aided together. Technology could be off, and then big companies like Google will say, we could build that shit ourselves. It's not as valuable to me. But putting that into the equation, and, is very helpful in how you put yourself in the range. The one thing, advice I'd give to entrepreneurs today is stop reading the bullshit about Facebook and Instagram. I sit with people like, I wouldn't sell for $100 million. I'm like, 
really? <laughs> Someone gave me $5 million. I'm taking $5 million. I'm not saying I would do that today. We've well, got to think about being realistic. And, and that's the unfortunate downside where people are mystified. There's more entrepreneurs than ever. In 08, there was no entrepreneur community in New York City that was stable and strong. And it's hard to get through it. And from investors, it's even harder to identify what are the real talented companies that will execute the business. Totally. And obviously at the later stage when you're talking about you know, some, of, some of these growth investors, private equity shops, they have ver very much a quantitative metric driven approach to valuations. Um, but at the early stage, a lot of it is subjective. A lot of it is, is investing in the person. Um, I, th I think we have time for one more, if I'm not mistaken, if anyone. Anyone? How many people here are entrepreneurs? I, I know he wants to ask a question and he's an entrepreneur. Go ahead. Yeah, so no, I got it. He said, so back when I was raising money for Source 3 recently, you know, it, it, we changed one word and it changed everything. It did. It just, we, we, we changed the word. We, we're like, we're a platform. People are like, I get it. They're a fucking platform. <laughs> Seriously, we just changed the word. Like, no, no offense to our investors. Yeah, right? But then I told, I, I told a good story around it. But we had confidence, you know, don't listen to me because I walked in the room with my own capital and I was like, I don't need your money. And people were like, wait, 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 please don't leave. You know, I was like, I could do this myself all day long. But I'm an outlier right now. But, but the key to that was really try to figure out your best positioning and think about it. Just don't come up with an idea. You have to translate that. You know, unfortunately, people like Dex today, you know, like that's the, the typical way. But they want to really talk to you and understand how you're rationalizing, how you can execute the business, and you have some assumption thinking. That's the key, you know, really. We, did, we joke around with that, and, and, but it's really just positioning yourself, but positioning is the thought logic around how you're gonna get there. Yeah, Patrick mentioned Dex. Obviously incredibly important to kind of have that traditional presentation outline, but at the end of the day, you're gonna walk into an office and it's, uh, it's about you, so be prepared to just talk. And, and they didn't even read it. <laughs> and, and they didn't, and they, they might not have read it, yeah. um, depending on how senior the guy is. I'm reading everything I get, just FYI. <laughs> um, but yeah, just be prepared to chat, to chat honestly, and, and go through kind of logical thinking and things of that nature. And I think that's incredibly important. Very important, get to the partners. Get to the partners. No, no, no. If Jake is awesome, but get to the partners. They're the ones with Jake. Jake probably does deals, but start other firms. Get to the part, or ultimately get to the decision maker and get no. Get quick. to the decision maker. That's a better way of saying it. Get, and and get it depends on the fund. Yeah, he uh, could be. He'll be the decision maker impacting. Yeah. But all right, cool. Thanks, guys. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you.